We're in the middle of a new phase in the culture war that first started in the 1960s. But instead of left against right, now each side has fragmented into different tribes, fighting amongst themselves. A multipolar war. Welcome to Culture War 2.0. To navigate it, we need new tools. Buckle up. So I think people have a, an idea of what the culture war is, is, is people battling over ideas, uh, mainly in the political landscape. And in our white paper, uh, we invited the reader to view Culture War 1.0 as what was occurring in the, the 90s, something between the, the secular left versus the religious right. And some of the battlefronts there were you know, gay marriage, uh, women's issues, abortion. And largely, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, is that Culture War 1.0, the secular left, won it, essentially. And this opened the door for Culture War 2.0. So I think to understand that transition, uh, it's important to uh, view this uh, idea, mental model from international relations called polarity. There's three types of polarities. There's unipolarity, there's bipolarity, and there's multipolarity. Uh, unipolarity is um, one country essentially dominating. So Pax uh, Britannica or Pax Americana. Uh, Bipolarity is, is the Cold War, when there's, there's two superpowers sort of keeping each other in, in check, the U.S. and the USSR. And multipolarity is when there's multiple countries that were maybe equally powerful. Um, and you, you, you're, there's a lot of uncertainty in these situations. And usually these are the most chaotic moments in our, our history. Uh, so just before World War I or before World War II, it was said to be a multipolar state. So we use this polarity idea uh, with the culture war. Culture War 2.0 was a multipolar affair, where there's not just two ideas, two positions in logical space fighting with each other. It was a multitude of different ideologies combating. So all these different viewpoints, or what we dubbed memetic tribes, it's, it's sort of like capture the flag, but it's, it's capture the meta-narrative, the, the narrative that can house all these different narratives. So the term that we like to use is the, the noosphere, essentially just the collective consciousness. So it seems like a race between capturing this meta-narrative. I have a sort of a proclivity to engage in all sorts of ideas uh, from all, all the spectrums, the political spectrums, the philosophical spectrums, the theological ones. So I created a group called the Intellectual Explorers Club. So the idea is that we're performative agnostics, where we can act as if an idea is true, without accepting it as true. It was something interesting about the frame of the group, the Intellectual Explorers Club, because it attracted and invited all sorts of different people with different ideologies, from feminists to men's rights activists to conservatives, liberals. And I was the facilitator taking in all these points of views and just feeling the tension of, of people waiting for their turn so they can spit out their position. And I think this afforded me uh, an understanding uh, like on a visceral level of uh, the culture war because I got a front row seat to it. To speak personally, um, I felt the uh, existential loneliness just sort of being in my intellectual circles having a conversation because there's a sense that people were so egoically attached to their ideas that they were just waiting for you to finish talking so they can kind of, you know, impose their worldview on you. And there's a lack of, of care on all fronts from all, all spectrums. And I found the act of understanding someone's worldview, uh, what they believe to be true, sort of like an act of love. Uh, it, it disarmed them in a way. And it disarmed me too, because it invited me into their world. And uh, it was unexpected, um, the insights that I got from it. And the metaphor I like is the blind men and the elephants, where, where there's all these blind men, they're touching an elephant, and they view their point on the elephant, where they're touching either the trunk or, or the tail, as their reality. And what the good thing about that is, is that they're hyper-focused on that area. They feel the texture, they can smell it. And that affords them ability to see things that we might not otherwise see if we weren't touching that spot. But the problem is, is that if you just view that spot as the entirety of reality, then you're in trouble. You need to talk to each other. 
So the way I see the culture world right now is all these blind men just yelling at each other, you know, violently. Um, and my hope, my, my kind of this idea of being a performative agnostic is to get people to invite them in a space of playful uncertainty, a sex, sexy uncertainty, if you will, uh, so they can get to talk to each other and figure out their world. So mimetic tribes, uh, you're probably familiar with some of the names that are active in the culture war, whether they be the social justice activists, Black Life Matters, uh, Me Too, Alt-Right, Manosphere, uh, we can even say the New Atheists, or Rationalists, Post-Rationalists, Street Epistemologists, any sort of worldview that's sort of defining what culture is and, and sort of imposing their view on it. And we, we created the spreadsheet where we had a taxonomy, this meta taxonomy that had uh, uh, telos, their, their main purpose, what, what's their, their goal, um, existential threat, what are they most worried about, uh, mental models, how they, how they view the world, their sacred values, what do they view most important that if you transgress it, you'll trigger them. And I think, you know, a trigger warning applies to all mimetic tribes, all sort of worldviews. And the idea is that these mimetic tribes are all combating with each other and all these odd alliances are forming. Um, there's a, the class-based left is, is, is fighting against the, the social justice left. Uh, reactionary right is, is fighting against the more traditional conservative. Uh, the alt-right versus the alt-left. Um, there's no uh, kind of clear grounds anymore. And this is creating, a, I think, a sense of anxiety because we don't know what we're going to say. And if we say something, it might trigger a certain tribe that we don't want to be triggered. I do think there is uh, intertribal competition uh, amongst what was traditionally known as the left and then the right. Um, like, I, like I mentioned, uh, the class base left versus the social justice left. This idea of cancel culture, or what Mark Fisher calls the vampire castle. Uh, people on the, the left, just as well as people on the right, could get canceled these days. And same thing with the, the right. There's this whole thing, uh, don't punch right but that a lot of people are punching right and left these days. And so there's a sense that, you know, you don't know what will defend what people or what will trigger what tribe. The idea was an invitation to the reader to look at it from a different perspective. And I view this, this, this whole, whole white paper in Mimetic Tribes and the frame that this is a multipolar, almost postmodern war is, is sort of a psychoactive drug because if you see the, the mimetic tribe that you belong to alongside all these other mimetic tribes, that might jog you out of uh, your belief system just for a moment. One aspect about mimetic tribes is this, this sense that they're disembodied because they're exercising this sense of tribalism around a certain idea, a certain ideology, a certain meanplex, but they're not really meeting or cohering in person. And there's a, an egoic aspect to this, they're, they're, they're egoically attached to the ideas that they're are fighting uh, with. Where I think what Rebel Wisdom is uh, gesturing towards and various different people in the sense-making web is trying to create an embodied tribe where people actually get together in person and explore ideas. So we had four events that brought us to where we are today in Culture War 2.0. Event one was Surprisingly, the fall of Occupy. Uh, there was uh, an energy in the air when Occupy was going on, a revolutionary spirit uh, with the left. Um, it was a class-based left. And when Occupy fell, there was a, a period of leftist activism on the left that went kind of quiet in the mainstream from around uh, 2011 to 2015. And during this time, uh, the left at least publicly pivoted towards more of a social justice uh, ideas, more, more of a, what they call woke. And what was interesting to notice during this time period, because it seemed like social justice was in the air and it was just amplifying. And corporations co-opted the social justice memes, uh, specifically HR departments and PR departments. And we had this kind of provocative line is that corporations can be woke, but they can't be anti-capital. So this essentially neutered the left for a time period, uh, the, the, the class-based left. And it sort of amplified the social justice narrative in society at large. So the second event was uh, Oberfell versus Hodges. This is when the Supreme Court in America uh, legalized gay marriage across the country. 
And as Rod Dreyer said, this was the death blow uh, to the religious right. This was the end of the culture war, uh, as he put it, or culture war 1.0, uh, as we framed it. And this was sort of the beginning of culture war 2.0. So event three, uh, we provocatively said, was Caitlyn Jenner. And I recall hearing something uh, from Joe Rogan, or what I believe I heard from Joe Rogan, and he essentially said that the reason why Trump won was because Caitlyn Jenner. You know, right when uh, the gay marriage uh, legislation was passed, the trans issue just rushed into uh, the public, uh, public mind. Um, and a lot of people might have not been ready for this this slew of trans issues started arising. Uh, bathroom bills, uh, trans athletes, uh, and pronouns. And a lot of famous figures in the culture war uh, came on the scene due to these issues. A lot of the figures in the intellectual dark web, for example, like Ben Shapiro um, and our Toronto's own Jordan Peterson uh, came out specifically uh, for the pronoun issue. Event four, the chaos president Donald Trump, and there, there was something in the air uh, when, when Trump was running. It just felt like chaos, something, uh, we were seeing something that hasn't happened before. And there's a quote by Trump too, he says, he loves chaos, and maybe it's a part of his negotiation strategy of how he makes people, uh, puts people in a state of uncertainty, and he's bringing his business techniques and his negotiation techniques into the political arena. And during this time, too, there were there's weird occurrences with uh, Pepe the Frog, uh, the Chaos God. And there was just a, this sense that something was going on that was destabilizing to everyone. So we talked about six crises and four events that led to Culture War 2.0. And I think it's uh, useful to have uh, these in mind because they offer sort of a historical and, and philosophical uh, events that occurred um, that sort of give uh, understanding of where we are today. So the first one that we, we talked about was secularization and the meaning crisis. And how I hold the meaning crisis, or one way that I, I hold it, is there's this lack of meta narrative or grand narrative that sort of justifies an ecology of practices that can engender uh, and sustain a felt sense of meaningfulness. And we don't have that anymore. Uh, we reference the, the famous Nietzschean line, God is dead. And the idea that once the Christian meta-narrative got destroyed in society, there was no justification for doing a lot of things that might engender that state of meaningfulness. And a lot of uh, secular theorists they have this term called the subtraction theory of secularization and the idea that once you remove uh, religion from our formal institutions will become all rational and scientific but as uh, the famous Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor points out that's not the case uh, we won't be evolving around a new meta narrative of science and rationality we're more likely to um, evolve into a state of plurality where all these different viewpoints are wrestling with each other the next crisis is the reality crisis and the ingredient associated with that is fragmentation. And I like Scott Adams' analogy of the, the two movie screens in the culture war. So you're looking at the same reality, like let's say something about Trump's impeachment, and uh, CNN is like raging against Trump, he's, he's, he's literally Hitler, and then Fox News is viewing Trump as some sort of savior. And uh, Scott Adams invites everyone to have this two movie screen idea to look at reality through these lenses. Um, but we suggest in our white paper is that it's not just two movie screens, it's a Netflix variety level of reality tunnels coming at us. And if we're sensitive to all the ones that are active, then we might get a better sense of how to navigate this space. And uh, the French postmodern philosopher Lyotard, he calls the postmodern condition not one of relativism, but one of fragmentation. And that is the sense that we're in a, a situation where all these different metaphysics and epistemologies are actively trying to impose themselves and sense make, but without communicating with each other. Atomization and the belonging crisis. I like the, the notion of Martin Buber's I-it versus I-thou relating. 
And I think we're in a situation where, and you can kind of like plop in your capitalism critique, uh, that we're in a I it relating environment. And C. Wright Mills, uh, he has a, a wonderful term called the marketing mentality. It's not only am I treating you as an instrument to use to get to something, I'm also making myself an instrument for, to be used uh, so you can get to something. And this is sort of a, a sense of bullshits in the air. People are not relating for its own sake. They are relating in order to the profit motive or uh, means to an end. And I think there's a sense of deep, deep loneliness that's associated with this. And so people are running towards uh, things maybe they shouldn't be running towards, such as mimetic tribes. So individuals are instrumentalizing each other. The I it in Buber terms is I'm treating you as an object to get something from you and not treating you as a, a human being that I can relate with. So globalization and the proximity crisis, all these tech utopianists, they thought that the internet or Facebook or social media was going to be a panacea. They're going to connect everyone. But that has not been the case. And uh, another Canadian philosopher, uh, Toronto's own uh, Marshall McLuhan, he predicted uh, the situation. He called it the global village. And he viewed it as a point where disagreements will occur on all fronts. He did not have uh, a naive view of the situation. And uh, philosopher Byung Chal Han, uh, he says that distance creates respect. But when you don't have that distance from someone or their viewpoints, when you know too much about them, then a spectacle emerges, then, then, then battles uh, occur. And this is uh, kind of verified by modern uh, psychologists when they have these terms called uh, dissimilarity cascades. The more you actually know about someone, the, the more you dislike them. And uh, environmental spoiling. Uh, once, envir once you don't like someone in an environment, it corrupts the whole, the whole ecosystem. And so, you know, the, the whole saying, uh, good fences make good neighbors. We tore down our fences. We can peer inside someone's worldview, someone's philosophy. And it's triggering, especially if it uh, transgresses our, our sacred values. And I love this saying, uh, in my more naive days, uh, you know, if you know someone's complete story, you cannot help but love them. And that might be true, but maybe the step before that is you have to hate them. So stimulation in the sobriety crisis, we're living in a state of uh, what they call uh, supernormal stimuli, that uh, due to the profit motive or, or whatever, there's certain stimuli that are just so extreme, so exaggerated, that it triggers our evolutionary response. Uh, porn, pornography is an example of this, uh, laugh tracks, uh, junk food, sugar, whatever. And social media is a prime example of this. Uh, the likes, you know, we're hunting for the likes and we've been addicted to these platforms in very subtle ways too. We referenced this study on the jewel beetle. So in Australia, there was this jewel beetle that almost went extinct. And the reason why is because uh, there was these beer stubbies that uh, people started throwing uh, in, in their kind of ecosystem. And they kind of looked like a female's uh, butt, right? Uh, and the males, they started having or uh, attempted to having intercourse with these beer stubbies. And they were dying off because they, it, was just, it was so exaggerated, uh, the beer stubby that they were trying to make love with it. And they just were starving to death. They were ta being attacked by ants. And so the population almost went extinct. And then once they started removing uh, these beer stubbies, then they started coming back. And we use that as a metaphor for our current situation. So the weaponization in the warfare crisis, we start the section off by talking about Alexander Dugin, which some people refer to as Putin's brain or the most dangerous philosopher in the world. And uh, he wrote a book in the late 90s, sort of outlining some of the stuff that Russia is doing today about sowing discord uh, in America, in America's internal politics. And uh, the strategy there was to fund and, and, and support radical groups within America to make them fight each other. And uh, by following the 2016 election and, and the Russian uh, sock puppet army, um, they did this strategy. They they did uh, they fund Bernie Sanders, the the Green Party, Trump. They even Trump uh, they even funded a, a pro and anti Trump rally at the same time, just to create what some uh, people call chaos operations, create chaos for its own sake. And it's just not Russia doing this. It's other countries, um, corporations, lone wolf hackers, 
mimetic mercenaries like Cambridge Analytica. Everyone is trying to weaponize our mind right now. And we're in a, a vulnerable state because we're addicted to these platforms, referencing back to the sobriety crisis. We're being weaponized for reasons we're not even aware of. How do we mediate amongst all these warring tribes? And I view mimetic mediation as the hard problem of culture war 2.0. In referencing the blind man and the elephant, how do we get all these blind men uh, to talk to each other? So the exciting thing that I find about mimetic mediation is it's an open conversation. It's an open discussion on what exactly it is, what mindset is needed in order to adopt it, and what kind of techniques and tools can we use to go about it. Um, and I have some ideas that I'm playing with, and I invite the listener right now to kind of uh, and join in on this conversation. But there's things that we're experimenting with in Toronto called the anti-debate, where it's sort of a, a gamification of understanding. Um, there, there's conversational modalities like empathy circles where they apply Carl Rogers' active listening to a four-way conversation. Um, getting people to look at news sites, uh, meta news sites like All Sides that kind of shows the bias of each news platform on one issue. Uh, or letter.wiki inviting uh, intellectuals that might not have uh, spoke to each other otherwise to get them to have a long-form good faith conversation. So the Matrix introduced this concept of the blue pill versus red pill. And uh, this was co-opted by more of a reactionary tribes, but going back to its original meaning, uh, the blue pill is what you're born into. It's, uh, nobody really takes the blue pill. You're given the blue pill, and you're not aware that you're taking the blue pill. So it's unexamined uh, consensus reality. And the red pill is the dark truths that you have not yet explored. It's, it's the views that sort of rip your current or previous reality uh, underneath your feet. And taking the red pill has a tendency to uh, tribalize us, make us angry, give us sort of a, a purpose to fight uh, for something. Where there's another pill uh, that uh, Venkatesh Rao calls the gray pill. And this is a pill that sort of muddies the water of your previous red pill truths. It adds a little bit uncertainty to your positions. Uh, and at first, this might be anxiety producing. This might uh, engender an ex existential crisis. But if you stay with it long enough, if you stay with that, that gray pill sense, life starts becoming playful. You can start playing with ideas. Uh, there's a, a sexy uncertainty starts emerging. And taking the gray pill is reintroducing nuance into the, the public conversation and into your own mind. Uh, there's, there's too much certainty out there. There's certainty with the blue pill, certainty with the, the red pill. And the, the gray pill offers us to speak in such a way where um, we can be assertive with our, with our truths, but with a caveat saying, I could be wrong. So there's a sense that I think lots of us share is that debate is broken. Um, People uh, are just talking past each other. It's sort of a dog and pony show. And there's this term by Scott Aikens and Robert Talese that I quite like called uh, the dialectic fallacy, where you're, you're sort of gesturing towards your interlocutor that you're having a conversation with them, but really you're just trying to score points to your tribe. So the anti-debate is an idea to attract people to the debate format, but it's not about winning. It's about who can be better at understanding so really it's a, a Trojan horse towards more authentic dialogues. And once you get, the, we experimented with it in Toronto and it's quite powerful. Once you get a taste of that, you want more of it. And, and once you get rid of that adversarial frame, you just sort of lose the structure. And then you just want to have a free associative exploratory conversation. So there's this term that uh, I quite like called the metacrisis. Uh, how I currently hold it is that there's a, a lot of existential risks out there from uh, economic, environment, uh, AGI that threaten our existence. And with all these existential risks is coupled with this inability to sense make, inability to have conversations to figure out what to do about it. And all the crises that uh, we, we mentioned are sort of baked in this, this meta crisis. And my sense, and I think John Verveke would agree with me, is that the first domino to knock over uh, 
to address all the other crises is the meaning crisis. And there's a sense amongst the uh, sense makers and the sense making web is that meeting in person and engaging in these authentic dialogues, whether it's circling, uh, restorative circles, uh, insight dialogue, to get in person and do these things and create a more embodied tribe rather than just a mimetic tribe could be the answer. So I could be wrong, but my sense is that uh, we need to be more comfortable with uh, the state of uncertainty. And uh, the Intellectual Explorers Club here in Toronto is an opportunity for that. It's an opportunity to be a performative agnostic, to sort of explore different ideas that are radically foreign to you. And once we're uncomfortable with this state, once we, we add nuance uh, to our ideas and we become gray-pilled, then I think we can start practicing uh, these conversational modalities, these, these authentic um, conversations that invite us to explore areas where we don't know where we're going. And I think that is needed in order to address uh, the situation we're in. Well done for making it to the end. Just wanted to let you know a few things we've got coming up, including the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival which will be a mix of ideas and dialogues between people like Daniel Schmachtenberger, Benita Roy, Rupert Sheldrake, John Vivekey and many more. And because wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's also about practice, we'll be offering experiences like circling, different interpersonal dialogue, mindfulness, breath work and many other with world-class facilitators. And if you're enjoying the content, you can help us make more by joining the Rebel Wisdom Club, which will give you discounts on the courses and the events, and also access to a load more content on the website, including all of our live events. It'll also give you access to our growing community, which is something we want to make a real focus for 2020, adding more meetups and other services for members. So, hope you enjoyed the film and see you soon.